So there's been somewhat of a population boom for haddock off the northeastern United States. And this is thanks to a, a sequence of some exceptionally strong year classes. And this unprecedented abundance of large adult haddock has understandably become a favorite target of recreational anglers. The bulk of the uh, stock, as well as the fishing effort, is concentrated here in the southwestern portion of the Gulf of Maine, off of the northern mass and New Hampshire coasts. And this is traditionally a multi-species fishery that catches a variety of ground fish species, but primarily targets both cod and haddock. Unfortunately, cod have not fared as well as haddock over the years and are currently near an all-time low. And for this reason, the New England Fisheries Management Council has put some pretty severe restrictions in place on the cod fishery. The commercial quota has been drastically reduced multiple times. Closed areas and seasons have been created and expanded. And um, the recreational harvest of cod was completely eliminated for several years in a row. Now, despite this last measure, the discard mortality of cod, cod is bycatch in the recreational haddock fishery is now the leading source of mortality in the cod stock. So to put this in perspective, this is a species that has been the mainstay of New England commercial fisheries for half a millennium and is now predominantly a recreational species for which anglers can't even keep a single fish. And the level of regulation that's currently in place on the cod fishery leaves managers with few tools left in the box to further reduce fishing mortality on cod without also directly limiting the fishery's access to the abundant haddock stock. And so to avoid the need for these kinds of measures, uh, we're seeking to provide guidance to the recreational fishery as to where they can go haddock fishing and avoid cod. The idea behind this project and what gives us some hope that such an approach is possible comes from observations that we've made aboard a new bottom trawl survey conducted by the division known as the industry-based survey. And this survey was initiated in response to the depleted state of the cod stock but it also collects a lot of good information on a wide variety of groundfish species. It also intensively samples the footprint of the recreational fishery, both spatially and seasonally. And we've made more than a thousand toes spread across eight months in each of the three years from 2016 to 2019, which collectively, this represents 10 times the survey effort of the federal bottom trawl air within this area. And through this work, we've identified several times in areas where had, haddock are abundant and cod are not. So the first step in the project was to develop a series of geostatistical models of the seasonal distribution and abundance of each of the primary species of groundfish captured by the recreational fishery. You can see here that we've broken out haddock into those fish that are above and below the minimum legal size. We related our survey observations to a set of habitat variables, focusing on those for which we could assemble a continuous surface across the entire study area so that they'd be most useful for prediction going forward. And these included depth, which comes from a high resolution digital elevation model, seafloor complexity, which is just a simple convolution of this DEM, and bottom temperature, which comes from an oceanographic model maintained by SMAS at the University of Massachusetts. I used generalized additive models to account for the nonlinear relationship that many of these species have with their habitat. For instance, they have, might have a preferred depth, temperature, or seafloor type, which may vary seasonally. And so we selected the best fitting model via the Bayesian information criterion from a set of candidate models that included all the possible nonlinear interactions between our three habitat variables, as well as a cyclical seasonal pattern, a residual spatial pattern, and a year effect. And so as an example, the best fitting model for cod included an interaction between depth and season, an interaction between temp and season, a residual spatial pattern that did not vary seasonally, and a significant year effect that captured the continued decline in general cod abundance. And in contrast, while the best fitting model for large haddock also had interactions between depth and season and temperature and season, haddock had a 
generally broader habitat preference that included both deeper and warmer water. Paddock had a residual spatial pattern that varied seasonally and here the significant year effect captured the continued increase in abundance of large haddock. And so by using the best fitting models for each species and incorporating our habitat data, we can create a continuous predicted surface of the density of each species in each month of the year. But this is still viewing the world through the eyes of a bottom trawl survey net. And we're trying to make predictions about the expected catch rate of a recreational fishery where anglers use one or two baited hooks. And there are some fundamental differences in the way each gear interacts with the fish population that we needed to account for. Now in both cases, we'd expect that the catch per unit of fishing effort is approximately proportional to the density of fish on the seafloor. But this only works if our measure of fishing effort is equivalent to the amount of time the gear is actually on the bottom. And Herein lies a major difference. In a bottom trawl survey, the measure of fishing effort is the time on bottom. We start the clock when the net is at tow speed on the seafloor, the winches are locked, and we stop the clock when we re-engage the winches to bring the net up to the surface. Yet in recreational angling, we typically count as fishing effort the entire time you're on the water with a fishing rod in your hands. And so, when you're fishing in deeper water, you spend proportionally more time dropping your line down and reeling fish up through a longer water column. And this takes away from the time on bottom and reduces the potential catch rate that you can achieve. Another major difference is that it's rare for a bottom trawl survey tow to be saturated by the density of fish. Yet when recreational angling, you're reeling up your line as soon as you feel the bite from a single fish. This means that when you're fishing in a high density area, you have a high catch rate, you're spending most of your time reeling up, unhooking fish and dropping back down. And this is further complicated by the presence of non-target species. Any time spent catching non-target fish takes away from the potential catch rate of your target species. And lastly, we also needed to take into account differences in feeding behavior because each species has a different attack rate for a baited hook, which may vary as a function of size. And so I developed a system of nonlinear equations to account for these relationships and allows us to translate the predicted density from the bottom trawl into an expected catch rate for recreational anglers. The next step of the project was to conduct field work uh, to estimate the key parameters and validate the predictions of our spatial models. And we put uh, ourselves, friends, family members, many of the folks here on the call onto charter boats and went fishing for two summers. Um, we made more than 80 trips aboard four different vessels. We fished at over 600 different locations. We took out more than 200 individual anglers and we caught over 10,000 fish. But we did all this in a very standardized way. We used identical bait rigs and tackle we established a protocol to distribute our fishing effort broadly in space and season. We precisely recorded the depth, location, and times of fishing. And not only did we record the species and size of each fish we caught, we gave every angler a stopwatch and had them record the time to drop to the bottom, the time spent waiting for a bite, the time spent fighting fish to the surface, and the time spent unhooking and getting ready to drop your rig back down. And so this allowed us to break that total measure of recreational fishing effort into its component subcategories and thereby determine which variables affected the bottom time that's lost for each fish that's caught. And all of these observed data allowed us to fit our trawl to recreational translation model using maximum likelihood methods. We found that cod in both size classes of hot haddock had a substantially higher catch rate, higher attack rate than other species which is perhaps to be expected given that these are the target species in this fishery and for this gear. We also estimated a size selectivity function for each species, as well as the influence of variables like depth, fish size, and angler experience on the different time categories of fishing effort. This fitted translation model now allows us to convert the predicted density into an expected recreational catch rate. 
And notice here that we've colored the species we're trying to avoid, cod, in red, the group of fish that we're targeting, legal-sized haddock, in green, and an example of a group of fish that simply gets in the way, sublegal haddock, is gray. Also, I'll point out here that there can be a pretty substantial difference between the distribution of the fish on the top there with the spatial pattern of recreational catch rates at the bottom. And this is because so much depends on the depth and mix of species at any given location. And our model appears to be doing a decent job of predicting where our observed recreational catch rates are at. Where it predicts we'll catch, we'll have a low catch rate of a given species, we catch few fish. And where it predicts we'll have high catch rates, we catch quite a bit more. The next step was to take all of these predictions of recreational catch rates and distill them into some simple, straightforward, but meaningful guidance for the fishery. The approach we took was to classify areas as either a place to target that had a high haddock to cod ratio or a place to avoid that had a low haddock to cod ratio. And the easiest way to visualize how we did this is to plot the catch rate of haddock versus cod at each location on the map. And then if we draw a diagonal line through the origin representing a fixed haddock to cod ratio, this line delineates the boundary between the avoidance areas in red and the target areas in green. But one problem with this approach is that you can get the exact same ratio in areas of high abundance as areas of low abundance. And we're not really concerned with these low abundance areas that generally have poor fishing overall. So we established a minimum catch rate for both cod and haddock to effectively filter these areas out. And so a potential classification rule can be viewed as a single point on this plot at the intersection of these three lines. We can then look at our observed catch data and calculate the difference in cod and haddock catch rates between the two area classes. And then the only thing remaining to do is to systematically search this plot for the best classification rule that maximizes the difference in catch rates between the red and green areas, while at the same time maintaining um, significant spatial extent for each class so that the guidance could be meaningful. And ultimately, these are the guidance maps that we created by month. You can see that there are some areas that seasonally are green, such as between Plymouth and Stellwagen Bank in May and June. Some areas flip between green and red seasonally, such as Stellwagen Bank itself. And other areas remain red throughout the year, such as Jeffrey's Ledge. But on the whole, we found from our recreational fishing observations that the green areas had a 12% higher haddock catch rate and a 33% lower cod bycatch rate. Well, the last step of this project, communication and outreach is arguably the most critical because we're asking anglers to voluntarily alter their behavior. We're not seeking to establish a new rule or regulation with this work. In fact, we're trying to uh, prevent the need for such a rule. And to this end, we combined our red and green guidance areas with a high resolution bathymetric image of the sea floor and a NOAA nautical chart overlay to make these products more desirable to the fishery and increase the chances that they'll be picked up and taken out on, on the water and referred to. And so we incorporated these maps into the new recreational haddock fishing guide. We printed 35,000 copies that we distributed at sportsman shows, tackle shops, and permit offices. We also made the maps available electronically through this Avenza smartphone app, which allows you to see exactly where you are on the map. You can zoom in and see all of the bathymetric details. And the user interface is actually pretty good on this app. And in fact, we use it ourselves to conduct all of the validation fishing trips for the project. We also created a citizen science component to the project where we asked volunteer anglers to send us some basic catch rate data along with the times and locations fished so that we could determine if these maps continue to be relevant going forward. Now, it turns out that a global pandemic makes it challenging to distribute physical outreach materials in person. Sportsman shows were canceled, tackle shops closed, as were our own permit offices, and as you all know, vehicle restrictions for staff early on really complicated 
our ability to do these sorts of jobs in the field. But we still manage to distribute about half of the paper copies, and we plan on distributing the remaining guides for the 2021 fishing season. But I'm very thankful that we made the effort to distribute the maps electronically because we had over 4,500 map downloads through the Avenza app. And this measure of engagement goes far beyond a simple number of page views or web clicks. This, these are folks who took the time to download the app, create an account, find and download our maps. And so there's a good chance that there were thousands of anglers that actually used our guidance maps in 2020. And we actually saw constituents recommend our haddock maps to fellow anglers multiple times on social media, which I took as a really positive sign. And for a guy who's often put in the position of breaking bad news to a beleaguered commercial fishery, it's a pretty nice feeling to have appreciative constituents. And for the citizen science program in 2020, we had 94 anglers sign up to participate. Only about 13 of them actually sent us some reports, but many of these anglers went a number of times. I think our highest was 22 trips uh, an individual did. And so we ended up with almost 100 observations. And because each participant typically took friends out with them, these data actually represent more than 40 individual anglers. The data provided by the citizen science effort suggests that the Haddock guide maps are still relevant and continue to be useful. The fishing observations that they made in the green areas yielded anglers a 39% higher catch rate of legal sized Haddock and a 24% lower cod bycatch rate. These uh, results represent the anglers who use the typical two hook bait rig, which is by far the majority. However, a small number of anglers did report using jigs. And even though they, these anglers only fished in the green areas, they caught two times the number of cod, none of which they were able to keep. And we estimate 15% of which die afterwards. They also caught half the number of keeper size haddock. So these results confirm what our previous recreational groundfish research has shown, that anglers should be using bait and not jigs, both for conservation and for filling their coolers. Each report that an angler submitted to us entered their name into a raffle for an end of season grand prize. And shown here is Pete Oldak, who fishes out of Amesbury. And he randomly um, won the drawing. He's a really nice guy who did six trips for us and ended up with a really nice Yeti cooler. And Noah has uh, reached out to us once again uh, to offer funds to extend this program. So we're hopeful that we can support another round of citizen science in 2021. So if you have any friends or know anyone who likes to go recreational ground fishing, um, pass them one of our recreational haddock guides and on the back cover is information on how to sign up for the citizen science program. If they send us one report, they'll get um, a really nice pair of um, aluminum pliers for free, and um, they'll stand a good chance at winning a really nice Yeti cooler. So with that, I just wanted to thank everyone that participated in this project, my co-PIs, Bill Hoffman and John Mandelman at the New England Aquarium, the charter boat captains um, put a lot of days on the water um, for us, and all of our scientific collaborators uh, both at DMF, at the aquarium, at NOAA, and at Rutgers. And lastly, all of the anglers that came out with us either for the validation fishing trips or the citizen science program. Um, thank you.